Hey. Short, short <clears throat> introduction of Dorian Mountain, one of our finalist artists, photographer from Duncan. And uh, we're pleased to have you here today. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here today as well on this nice sunny day. I'm glad you guys took time out of your day to come and, and talk. So today I'm going to, I have two stories I want to tell today. One story is kind of the story that was in the catalog and it's about my art career or such as it was. But there's another story, I hope we have time to get to that at the very end, that may or may not have anything to do with art. So I brought a prop. Let's just imagine this stone. This is a local stone I found up on Mount Suhalem. Got a lot of very interesting colors in it. Let's just imagine that this stone is the planet Earth. So in one day of travel in our orbit, Earth travels two and a half million kilometers. So in a year of traveling one circuit around the sun, that's like 940 million kilometers. So what I want to do is I want to wind this back. I want to go back in time. I want to go back in time 36 billion kilometers. That's 38 years. 38 years ago, I was standing in this very room for the first time. Um, it was my first trip to Salt Spring. And I had come for a, a week-long painting workshop with the Federation of Canadian Artists. And we had an entire week, I think it was August, we had an entire week traveling around Salt Spring to all kinds of beautiful locations, uh, painting in all kinds of different media. Uh, so that was my introduction to Salt Spring. And about five years after that, I had an opportunity first to go and actually have some formal art study. I went to uh, Capilano College. I spent two years in Capilano College focusing on illustration. That was, that was my love, was illustration. And shortly after that, um, I began my path, the expected path that I expected an artist should take. You know, an artist should be sketching, drawing, painting, doing whatever. You know, exactly like we did on Salt Spring uh, for that week. Going to locations, you know, breathing it in, trying to capture it, trying to give it back kind of thing. And for the next 50 years, I pretty much did the same thing, what I, exactly what I expected I should be doing. My next opportunity to have some formal training uh, came in 1986. I was able to spend a year going to the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. My focus again was illustration. That's all I wanted to do. Uh, and I managed to um, have a year at third year level. It was pretty advanced. It was the place in Canada at the time to study illustration with the people who were teaching there. And what we did there was exactly what I thought we were supposed to be doing. And going out, drawing, painting, doing this as many times as possible and as intensively as possible. Like I was just, that was, I was living my dream. I get to do this now and I, so I, I was soaking it up. So to my first slide here, uh, one of the opportunities we had, there was a car show in Toronto and uh, we, as a school, as a class, we were invited to come down and, and do our thing. You know, there was actually a contest. You know, who's going to have the, the, uh, the best drawing or whatever. So I'm drawing on the spot here. You know, no reference, no photographs, drawing on the spot, painting on the spot. Uh, this car, and you know, I, I kind of like cars, so I was into that. We also went out to uh, different locations, which is part of what I really loved. I, you know, who doesn't love a good road trip when you're a student, right? So we would spend time out in places where there were lots of interesting things to draw. This is, uh, our location here was Pioneer Village where it's all uh, turn of you know, the eight, late 1800s log cabins, blacksmiths and horses and, and all that kind of stuff. So we spent uh, an entire day out there just sucking it up and loving it. One of the things about Black uh, Village, Pioneer Village, Black Creek, is that they actually have families living there who are interpreters and their kids have to go to school 
So they had this one room schoolhouse with uh, uh, a wood stove in the middle and actual, you know, teachers and lessons going on. And this little girl wondered, what was I doing there? I'm too old to be in class, right? This is a, like a grade five class or something like that. And I just wanted to show a, a, a detail here. So again, this is on location, drawing and painting. Uh, you know, no, no photo reference, no going back. And on to the next thing. I mean, we were very busy that day. We did a lot of stuff. So working at that kind of speed is one of the things that, that helps you f forget about, you know, worrying. You know, am I doing this right? Did I get that right? Uh, you know, just, just do it and keep going. See what happens. Uh, of course, we'd be spending time in the studio as well and all of what you would expect or drawing the figure and, and still lifes, uh, drawing from the model with your easel and fast poses, short poses, that kind of stuff, which is exactly what I expected I should be doing and would be doing, and that's what we were doing. So we did a lot of that. This is oil paint. Uh, I think it was the first or second oil painting I, I ever did. I'm painting on paper. So again, you don't have time to worry about, you know, what's my technique or what colors am I going to mix? You know, it, there's only so much time, maybe a couple hours in class, and you have to just just do it and, and, and don't don't question what you're doing. Keep going. Lots of figure studies. So on the way to school, of course, you know, you're thinking about what you're going to do to get to school. I'm drawing people on the buses and the subway and uh, Everything's moving, you know, the subway's moving, jiggling. People are const in constant motion. They never stop moving. But I, I was trying to train myself to, to just, just get it done, get it done fast, get it done quick, before somebody stands up and, and moves. There, there was a lot of that, a lot of people moving halfway through. You know, this guy doesn't even have a face. We were in, this was in a shopping mall there, Eaton Center, a big shopping mall, which is a great place to kind of plant yourself, become invisible, and have, you know, the world moving around you, uh, constant moving. Uh, and at the end, instead of being an artist, I tried to get the administration fired. Uh, I, was not I was not impressed with the administration. I found out that uh, because they had finally arranged to have their, their uh, strings to the money cut, they were given the money from the government and there was, there was no oversight. It was like, you know, we're, this is what we're doing to, you guys can have your, your intellectual honesty and integrity and we won't try and politically direct you. Well, what immediately happened was groups started finding, hey, we got all this money and we've got some friends and some people we don't like, so let's, let's you know, cozy up to our friends and get rid of the people we don't like. And I was just, I was just so offended. That's me with the sign. Now I look like this, which is really funny. I mean, I find that, I find that really funny. Uh, he, was, he was trying to get me to quit picketing out in the front of the school there. He actually brought me a coffee and, and wanted to be my pal. Anyways. So. That was school. Maybe one more here. Doug, can you help me just for a second, please? Yeah, you're getting close. Yeah, I'm getting close. I'm going backwards. And then you'll be an expert by the end of the day. Yeah, no doubt. Do you want to go to I just want to go down to the next folder. Oh, I should be. Let's double click on this one. Yeah. Okay. There we are. I can, I can work with that. So okay, after trying to get the administration fired, I saw that there wasn't going to be another year at OCA and doing all the fun stuff I would get a chance to do. So I left town. Uh, I was married at the time, I was married to another artist, and we decided that uh, we were going to take the long way home to Vancouver, which is where we were both born, and we decided that we would kind of roughly trace the art history of the Western, Western art. We'd start in Greece. Uh, at, at go all over Europe looking at the stuff that we'd seen in our history books. We wanted to go see the real thing. And of course, uh, all the time we're, we're drawing and painting, 
both of us were drawing and painting like mad fiends, fill, filling up sketchbook after sketchbook. I want to go back here. Uh, we went to the Vatican Museum, and the Vatican Museum is a sea of people, just an absolute river of people walking around all these, these things. So there were not many times or places where I could actually stand still for a little while and, and pay attention. This was one of them. I guess nobody cared about this. They're looking at something else. Uh, so I also had one of those little watercolor kits that everybody probably had in elementary school, you know, the folding top and the little chambers and, and like what, six colors or something like that. But between that and my bottle of water, which I always had, I had what I needed. And at the time, this is 1987 now, I'm traveling in Europe, and right at that time in 1987 there were uh, people attacking artwork with hatchets, knives, you know, uh, hammers. So in Italy at the time, which is where this is from, uh, they, were, they were very leery of artists. You know, anyone who came in with like a bottle of ink or something, they thought they were going to take the ink and throw it on the Mona Lisa or, uh, or something, right? So I actually had personal watchers watching me who didn't think I saw them doing this. I had to explain a few times that I was harmless. I don't know if they, you know, I don't know if they believe me. I'm, I, I'm okay. I just want to, I just want to see the art. Uh, and this was August, so it was very hot. And we found ourselves going inside cathedrals. This is where a lot of the art is, for one thing. But it was also uh, an escape from a really brutally hot summer. Actually, I think there were 2,000 people across Europe died in that summer from the heat. So this is a very restful place. And uh, actually, this particular piece is one of the first times I ever started trying to do watercolor without doing some shape or some form to follow. I was just starting to, to do it uh, freestyle. This is an incredible piece that's actually set below the floor. And I, I honestly don't realize. Oh, Santa Maria Maggiore. Don't even remember where that is. Uh, it's in Rome somewhere. But this is a piece actually set below the floor with banisters all around. And you, I guess the idea was that you know, this particular pope was so pious, Pius the Ninth, I guess. <laughs> but again, you know, I've got people all around me bumping in. Hey, what are you doing here? And actually people taking movies and photographs who want you to get out of the frame. Had that a few times. Uh, this was the... Uh, this is one of the famous churches in Florence that is in all the art books because of a painting inside that, that was one of the first paintings, Renaissance paintings, that attempted to uh, use perspective in a way that we understand it. And all the, all the artist was really trying to do was please the nuns at the time who said, you know, there's not a whole lot of room in here. Uh, but if you were to paint something, could you like make it look like there's more room? Like we do with mirrors now. If we put mirrors in here, the whole place would look really big. They were doing it with painting then. You can stand right where they had to stand to plan this thing. And they, the perspective is this roof going into the distance that's all just painted on the wall. There's a lot of places in, in a place like Florence where the history books will tell you about some particular event. And you can actually go stand there. This is what I really wanted to do. I wanted to stand where Leonardo stood, where Michelangelo stood, where Bernini stood. I wanted to be where all these people stood and see what they saw. And fortunately, you know, you can look at some of the stuff they saw or did. Okay, this is a little bit later. This, uh, this is on the way back. Uh, I've always had a thing for airplanes. This is in the Royal uh, Air Force Museum in uh, just outside of London. And during the Second World War, the Italians got in late and decided that, hey, it looks like the Germans are going to win. We should actually show that we're helping them. So they flew this biplane over, over England, where it developed an oil, oil uh, feed problem uh, and had to land. So they didn't have to shoot it down or anything. So I'm standing on a balcony, and I, I painted this there because, I mean, the, all that texture and stuff, there's no way I could kind of remember that. Uh, so I'm standing on a balcony, drawing in my sketchbook and painting right there, which I also did with this. This is a colored pencil uh, drawing of uh, Sopwith triplane, which is the same kind 
uh, is flown by Raymond Collishaw, who the airport in Nanaimo is named after. Or they have, they have a big uh, painting of Raymond Collishaw. So I had kind of a sweet thing for this Sopwith triplane. Oh, okay. Back to that. Yeah, I just want to get to that next folder. <clears throat> Okay, I think I can do that next time. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do it upside down. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so I've just shown a lot of, uh, you know, what I expect to be doing, being around beautiful things and trying to record them in some way. Uh, the other thing that I expected to be doing as an artist is studying under other masters. And unless, you know, you know a living master or whatever, you have to go and find their work, go and, and be in the presence of their work. And one way to study a work is to kind of recreate it in some, in some way. That used to be the standard art education was that you did copies of master's works. And that in that way, you either discovered their technique or found one of your own. So this might, might this is from the Tate Museum, I believe. Uh, and these are going to be from all over the place. They're from Paris. They're from London. I had a whole raft of colored paper, so I never knew what colored paper was going to come out next. I mean, I had a small, uh, small choice. I wasn't really sure. Um, in 1987, they opened a brand new Picasso museum, and it was set in uh, a villa. I don't know if it was one of his villas right in Paris. And I never liked Picasso. No, I never liked him. <laughs> but in this particular museum, they went chronologically, room by room, showing his work as it developed from a child to the, the latest work. And when I did that, I kind of understood. I felt like I understood how he got where he was. And the funny thing about this particular image is I had no idea what it was. It was just shapes and things until until I drew it, and then I could kind of, I could see it in a more abstract way and kind of understood there's somebody looking in a room. This is um, a, uh, an impression of a William uh, a Turner drawing from uh, Venice, I think that is. Also, uh, I found myself doing, doing uh, quick compositional studies of artists that I like. These are uh, Modigliani. Uh, studies of Modigliani's that were probably in the Louvre. And I've, I've <laughs> a little bit of Picasso too. And now that I actually cared a little bit about Picasso, I kind of got his sense of humor, I thought. And I thought, okay, he's, he's a rule breaker. He, he's willing to tweak everybody's nose. He doesn't care what anyone thinks. He's going to do his own thing. And I thought, well, that's pretty brave. Like in this, in this one particular image, I don't know, he's broken at least half a dozen rules of what you think are normal, you know? Like, is, is that the horizon? Like, is that some water? Is there, that person on a beach? Is that watermelon? What's going on there, right? I mean, he was, re he was ready to just have everybody scratch on their heads, just like uh, she's doing, I guess. Uh, another kind of a quick compositional sketch. Uh, one of the challenges for me uh, as an artist was always composing elements. I mean, I was okay drawing them as I saw them. When it comes to uh, making a, a final piece of your own, you know, how you place things is quite, quite central to what you're doing. There's some pretty funny art out there. Funny stuff. This was in Paris. I remember, I remember somebody looking over my shoulder as I was doing this asking me, are you a teacher? You must be a teacher. I said, no, no, and this is just, no, I'm a student. This is just me sketching. All right, I'm gonna try this now myself here. Okay, so I finally got home, and I started using 
you know, what, what had I learned on my trip? <coughs> so I, I tried to put all those little pieces into my own personal expression. And at the time, um, I, I didn't have a, a studio where I could make a big mess, so I chose to work in paper, I chose to work in chalk. I would be able to store paper easily, uh, you know, as opposed to wet paintings all over the place. And having grown up, I grew up in North Vancouver and Vancouver, and, and I was always close to the water, close to boats. And I found that I really liked being around marinas, just like here. I spent quite a bit of time um, on these uh, docks here, just looking at, just looking at boats in the sunshine. This is uh, I really enjoyed doing that. And I, I thought I had found a place where the subject matter and the technique kind of liked each other. They were comfortable with each other. So I carried on in this vein for a couple of years. <clears throat> this is a studio piece. Uh, <clears throat> here's a piece from Campbell River, I think it is. I had family up there at the time. And I actually translated a couple of these. You know, the, the next step for a, a fine artist is, okay, sketching and all that, that's well and good. But can you paint? Can you paint it? We'll, we'll get to that. This is kind of late in the series, and I started actually liking the things that, that weren't really sure. Like, you can't really see which, which of these lines is what the one it's supposed to be. Not really sure, and there's edges disappearing. <coughs> Things only half indicated. Oh, this is, uh, this was taken from reference. As, as I was traveling in Europe, I found myself on a, a circuit. There's a lot of tourists taking the same circuit. And this particular circuit was for the people who wanted to go see Sparta in the, on the Peloponnese Peninsula. And you get off the ferry, we uh, had come from Crete, you get off the ferry and you come into a little town called Githion. And it's always too late to go to Sparta, you can't go see it, because it's too late. So we spent time walking around, and what this place reminded me of, more than anything, was North Vancouver and Salt Spring. Not just because of the boats, but this is, a, this is an image from a, a little boatyard in the, in the bay, with uh, pine trees all over it. And it's in August, the sun's on the pine trees, and that, that beautiful fragrance that you get in BC, certain places, like the Okanagan, for example, which is where uh, I spent a lot of my childhood summers with uh, my grandparents. And I remember that beautiful perfume, and I, it just took me back home. Plus it had boats and water, which I kind of liked, and by this time, I was starting to kind of interpret things uh, more less what it was and more what I felt like I would like to see happening. And I wanted to see more abstract shapes and less, you know, reality, more kind of dreamy. Now, next I'm going to show you some uh, ink drawings. Now, I just had a show last December in uh, Cowichan Bay with the Ooh Gallery. Had a little show of these black and white drawings. This particular rowboat has recurred. We saw it in Conte there. Where actually, we're going to see it in oil paints. This particular rowboat just kept recurring to me. And pieces, there's less and less description going on. Almost every time I do it, pieces keep falling out that, that I I just chose to leave out. I think this was Couch and Bay. Got a few images from Couch and Bay that I was pretty happy with. And I was using a, I was using a, a te technical pen at this point. And I was really, uh, really liking the, the darks and lights and the shading and all that kind of stuff. But what preceded it was on the spot drawing. Those last three, those are studio drawings from reference. This particular piece is a, piece done right on the dock. I had a little folding uh, stool, and I had a portfolio with a pieces of paper roughly this size, and I would just sit that on my lap, put the piece of paper on top, bull clip it, get out my ink, and I would just start drawing what was in front of me. 
This is uh, a little piece. I'm sitting in the parking lot in Nanaimo looking down at the uh, boats and just drawing with the ink. You know, and, and if you make a mistake with ink, you do not get it back. But I kind of like sometimes that, you know, splatters happen and, and mistakes happen. You know, a bird flies by, you duck, and the line goes crazy. Uh, at some point, I'd done so many boats, I had to do something else, anything else. This is actually a junkyard up in Hilliers by where the goats are on the roof. It's around the corner. And uh, I sweet-talked this old toothless biker into letting me go in there because I was on a motorcycle at the time. And uh, he allowed me to go in as long as I promised not to look over the fence into the next junkyard. And I, he didn't tell me why he didn't like that guy. But I thought, oh, okay, fine. I don't need to look in the next junkyard. Your junkyard's full of the stuff I like, right? Here's another place where I thought the technique kind of met the, the subject. I mean, these, these old American cars are all beat up. And I just love this kind of this wiggly, wiggly line that's not literal anymore. I mean, it's like a snake. It goes all over the place. Uh, this, and this particular piece of paper, because I'm using ink, I'm using a cal, uh, cal, uh, calligraphy pen. And it loaded up with a lot of ink. So some of these lines were quite heavy with ink. And I thought I'd finish this thing. And I thought, OK, I'm, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand it up on something. And I'll step back and have a look. So I stood this drawing up. I went back to have a look. And this huge line of ink started dripping down the page. And I thought, oh, no, oh, no. I mean, you, there's no erasing. You don't erase ink. So I pretended there was a pickup truck there and, and faked it. And actually, I kind of like that now. I like that corner. Uh, this is a, an early, early piece from uh, Victoria Harbor. This is down in Victoria Way, too, almost up by Schwartz Bay. There's a, there's a little marina around the corner called Seam Harbor. And there are a lot of fishing boats in there, I guess because they're so close to the fishing grounds um, uh, just off the Fraser River which these guys, I'm sure they were fishing off the Fraser River. These two boats uh, came in, and they're the kind of boats I'd like. I mean, I especially like these boats that are come from originally from a Japanese design. I especially like those ones. These two guys came in, and, I, and these days, you don't get much time to go do your fishing. You know, you've got a, a couple hours, maybe, when you're allowed to be in some spot. So they came in, and they were changing their gear. Uh, and, and they were going to leave really fast. I got actually two drawings from these guys. And I thought, you know, if I just go f as fast as I possibly can, I might catch these guys. And here they are. Just before they left, they got their, they got their fresh gear. This guy, and I almost never have people in these drawings, but I, I, I wanted to put these guys in. Because one of the owners of the boats grabbed those two rollers in the back. And he just turned his boat to point out to leave. And they hopped in the boats, and they were gone. So I was kind of happy all that, all that uh, dynamic, just get it done, fast speed drawing that I'd been doing was, was coming to my salvation. OK. So I mentioned that I, you know, in, in my view, the, my, the, the, the classical path for an artist is to go through all these stages of learning how to draw, learning how to, how to see, learning uh, how, to, how to go fast and, and not look back, keep moving, improve, improve. And the end point had to be something, you know. The end point in, in my mind was going to be like oil painting. You've got to be an oil painter. So I did finally get around to oil painting things. It took a while, but I got around to oil painting some stuff. Uh, here's that rowboat again. I added a dock this time. And I started experimenting with different techniques, going from like high realism, you know, high photo reference, that kind of stuff, to something looser. That is what I kind of prefer. I wanted something that's more like a story being told than, than facts being recited. OK. So I had followed this path that I expected I should, that, that uh, a traditional artist should do. And I, 
when I was taught, I was taught by people who had followed that same path of being a traditional artist and you know, sketching and drawing and painting and being taught by other artists who also felt the same way. And I didn't realize it, but that was kind of a, that was kind of a, a path, you know? Even though there's a lot of different things can happen on that path, you are following a, a, a path of expectation. And I was able to retire a couple of years ago. I was living in Toronto, which is not the most creative place. And when I retired, I knew I was coming to Duncan. I have friends in Duncan. I had family on the island. I knew it was a beautiful place. And I thought, oh, finally, finally, I get to go be an artist on Vancouver Island. That is so cool. Uh, I even ended up owning a place where I finally have a workshop. I've never had a workshop. I had an entire room as big as this for my workshop. I've got, I've got easels. I've got tables. I hopped in my car, and I went down to Opus Painting Supplies in Victoria. And I loaded up on all the stuff I was going to need. Now that I was free to do my own thing, had the time and the space, the opportunity, and I loaded up with hundreds of dollars of, of paint, brushes, special uh, mediums. And I got home, and I thought, OK, now let's get started. And I, I just drew a blank. Just like this slide, there's, it was blank. There was nothing there. And I thought, what is going on? What's going on here? And it occurred to me, you know, if this happened to some other artist who for like 50 years had thought, look, I'm, I'm living my dream, this is my path, and your path disappears, what would you do? And I thought about cutting off my ear, but that's already been done, you know? I thought, okay, that, that, no, that would be a little bit too dramatic. So I just, I quit thinking about it. And I'm enjoying my new place. You know, I'm going for walks. And I started noticing, you know, when I go for walks, I'm walking up Mount Suhalem behind where I live. And I, I thought, you know, the rocks around here look funny. They don't look like the rocks I grew up with in, in North Vancouver. And it turns out that North Vancouver and Vancouver Island are made of completely different things. I thought, oh, well, that's so bizarre. Like this particular rock is a concretion. Does anybody know what that is? Are you familiar with concretions? OK, I'd never heard of these things. I'm looking at the weird rocks in my neighborhood that are falling apart, and there's like eggs inside. You know, like you're a, at a birthday party waiting for the nickel that your mom hid in there. There's eggs inside. And I'm pulling these things out going, what are these? You know, wow. So I Googled it. They're a rock that grows in a softer rock. I mean, they're, they start out like a, like a seed, like in a, 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 an oyster. They're like a pearl. They grow inside that softer rock, and they're much harder than the original rock. I tried to break one of these things. You can't do it. I wanted to see if there was something inside. So I started, I started noticing these rocks. I had a camera with me, and it was a, just a little point and shoot. And I started noticing that the way these rocks crumble was kind of interesting. They're, they were built in layers. They're a soft sedimentary rock. They're built in layers. And as they, as they weather, they're quite soft. The way the layers break off actually reveals something underneath. And what was underneath, uh, off times, is something of a completely different color. And I thought, well, that's weird. I've got, I've got gray on top, and I've got some kind of brown underneath, and it, it keeps going, you know? And this is ever-changing. As the weather, weather the, weathers these, uh, these rocks, the, the shape and the colors and textures keep changing. So I had my camera, and I thought, okay, I actually kind of like textures. I like textures, so and I see lots of texture around here. In fact, I'm just going to direct your attention now to my page in the catalog. This is one of those rocks. That's a rock on Mount Suhalem. And when I, when I, I took the picture, I had no idea uh, what, what I was going to do with it. It was one of many interesting <laughs> rock pictures that I had. I had no idea where it was going to go. But I've been a, a graphic artist using computers since uh, 1995, I guess. So I, ha I had a computer, I had software, and I had all kinds of tools to see if I could do something, anything, with these images that were 
basically texture. So what I want to show you now is some pictures that I took not long ago. I think it was maybe a couple months ago. Cranberry Road, just two kilometers from here. Uh, I was driving the back roads of Salt Spring and I came across an outcrop on the side of the road. So this is just a corner and this is the kind of rock that has been getting my attention for like the last year. It's sedimentary rock that's been tilted up and then starts to weather and it, the way it falls apart and, and weathers reveals things in it that are really surprising sometimes. So this is like a, 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 a really mad monkey from Cranberry Road. I'm going to demonstrate the process. Um, it's a pretty simple process. I'm using Photoshop. It has a lot of tools. I, I'm, I, I'm not conversant with all of them, but there are a couple of very simple tools. And what I like to do is I like to not take away from the original surface of the rock. I want actually the rock texture to still be there. I want to see what's going on. And just kind of by accident, uh, I stumbled on this idea of mirroring things. This is actually one of my first tests. This is a piece of linoleum from the art school down in, uh, down in uh, Victoria. I was visiting a friend. And they had an art show, and there was art all over the walls, but I was more interested in the linoleum, because I knew that linoleum was about 50 or 60 years old. And it had scratches and scrapes and all kinds of stuff. And I decided that I, would, I was going to flip a piece of it and see what happened. And what happened uh, is that I stumbled on something uh, that I find me kind of interesting. There is a part of your brain that was developed long, long ago, and it's, it's a survival thing, and we all have it. When we see uh, a, a symmetrical pattern around a, a vertical axis, our brain starts looking for biological life forms. It cannot stop doing this. It's automatic, like breathing. So if you look at one half of this thing, any, either half, what you're actually seeing is the surface of the stone. I don't paint anything in there and I don't move things around to try and get something. All I do is I, I take what I think might be an interesting piece of texture and I see what happens when I do this process of, of mirroring around the central axis. And it's funny, this is the, this is the principle behind Rorschach blots that psychiatrists use to get uh, their, you know, a, a patient's mind to start projecting and, and telling stories. And we all do this. We can't stop doing this when we see this. I mean, this, I accidentally came across this and I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, I wanted to see something new for myself in my art. I mean, I've kind of done all the boats and, and everything. And heard enough times, don't you do anything else? You don't do, any, do anything but boats. And I thought, yeah, I want something new too. You know, here I am in a new place, new time in my life. What, 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 what am I going to do? I had no idea what I was going to do. And I stumbled across this effect that happens in everybody. You know, it was happening in me, and I realized, okay, this is happening in everybody else, too. And I can't say that, they're, that I know what they're going to see when they look at this. I mean, this one here might only have so many interpretations, but there are ones where uh, there are multiple interpretations. That particular day, I think I spent, I might have spent an hour on Cranberry Road at this particular location. And I, I probably took 150 photographs and I ended up with at least a dozen or so uh, images that, <laughs> you know, kind of funky. I mean, this looks, I don't know what that looks like. But I want to show you the process. And you might laugh because it's simpler than you think. Okay. Here's the original image. <clears throat> like with pine needles and, and roots and, and everything. That's literally the image that I took with my little point and shoot camera. 
And what I do is I, I turn up the colors to the, they, the way you would turn up the sound on a stereo. I just turn them up a little bit. So the, the warm colors get a little warmer, the cool colors get a little cooler. I adjust the contrast, the lights and darks just a little bit to kind of show the form a little better. Here's the, the colors are turned up. Go back one here. No, okay. So okay, now I've I, I am composing, I am choosing my axis that's that's going to be used. And this is what happens when suddenly you mirror that. You go from you go from just a stone to somebody is looking at you. But it's not there. This is an entirely a construction of a very primitive area of your own mind. And it's just, I love it. Okay, that's, that's kind of it. One more thing I would like to say about this piece that you can see out in the hall is that this process is very simple. You know, it's a very literal photograph of a piece of texture. Very little has been done to it. There's, you know, a minor trick played. But sometimes when you turn these things upside down, they tell a totally different story, which is how that piece out in the hall started. It started out upside down. There's a completely different story going on when you see it upside down. Uh, it, when you look at it upside down, it appears to be some kind of pre-Incan corn god or something. And when, when I look at it this way, I see uh, it almost looks like a, a religious mural where the deities are cats which is a completely different story. So okay, how are we doing for time? Oh, we have just enough time for my next story. Power off, we don't need that. Okay. So my next story uh, has to do with something that happened to me in, in 1995. I'm gonna borrow this chair just for a second. And I'm going to start off with a quote. I get daily quotes to my email. You know, some of them are kind of interesting, some not. This is a Buddhist-related quote. Um, and this is a quote by a lady named Sandy Boucher. She says, despite our loyalty to our Western materialistic and scientific view, we may come to suspect that reality is actually multidimensional, that vestiges of other worlds sometimes accompany us, that a sacred embodied presence may be available to us if only we are open to it. Okay, and the, <laughs> the reason that that quote kind of resonates with me is because of what happened on this day in 1995. I was working at the CBC in the graphics department and I was working a, a, a holiday where nobody else wanted to work. I was the only guy in the department who had nothing better to do on the Monday. So Monday at six, I guess it was summer, it was nice and sunny, we're downtown Vancouver. And I thought, okay, I finally get to go home, right on. I hop in my car, which who remembers the Pinto? Everybody remember what the Pinto was? You didn't really have one of those. The Pinto was a death <laughs> trap. Yeah, I was actually, I had a station wagon, so I don't think it was as much of a death trap as the other kind, but it was falling apart and it was not a good car, but that's what I had at the time. So I'd finished my shift. I, I was looking forward to going home. And I had done this many times. I parked in the same parking lot, drove on the same streets through the same lights to get, take the same route to go home. So I'm doing what I had done so many times before. And this day was different. There was no traffic in downtown Vancouver. And I thought, okay, it's a holiday. No traffic in downtown Vancouver. Okay, I get it. I'm driving along. And I get to the, a series of lights where there's like three lights, and I never made those lights. This day, there's no traffic, and the lights are going for me. I, I don't have to stop at each one. I'm going, whoa, what's going on here? I usually stop at all of these lights. And I'm thinking, well, this is good. You know, I'm going to be home faster, and I don't have to stop and wait, and ah, there's no traffic anyway. So I'm getting to my, my last light where I get to turn left and go home. And in this section of Vancouver, it's, the buildings are older buildings. 
sidewalks are, are kind of skinny. And these like three-story buildings come almost to the corner, so you can't really see what's going on on either side at an intersection. So I'm coming to this intersection, and I have a green light. I can go through, and I thought, oh, perfect. I never make this light. And as I'm approaching the intersection, I noticed that I was gripping the steering wheel like this, both hands, and I was pushing myself back, and this foot was bracing itself on the dead pedal. And I looked down and went, what's, what, what's going on? I got three green lights. I'm going home. It's after six. There's no cars. I want to go home. And my body was going like this. And I looked at that. I went, well, this is pretty strange. But it looks to me as though my body is bracing for impact. And there was nothing to hit. I thought, I'm pretty sure my body thinks it's going to hit something really hard. So I got to the green light, and I thought, well, there's nobody around. I'm going to stop. So I stopped at the green light, and about a second later, a big Ford Explorer came flying through the red light. And their bumper was probably <laughs> at that height. And at that moment, I, you know, I'm in a Pinto. I would have been T-boned on the driver's side, and I, I don't think I would have survived. And even if the car got hit in some other way, I mean, I, I would not be here telling this story. So I watched this car go zooming by. They had just come off the Canby Street Bridge, so they were speeding as well. I mean, they weren't even just running the red light. They were going really fast. And I, I saw the passenger kind of look out the window and look at me with a look of surprise on their face. And I thought, oh, they knew they ran that red light. So I thought, I should have been there. I should have been right where that car came through. And I, I should be dead at this moment. So I thought about that. And on my way home, I thought, well, I better, I'm all jittery now. You know, I'm really jittery. I don't know what went on. I'm really jittery. I, I can't just go home. So I was driving by. Uh, the Bloedel Observatory, which has got a really beautiful park at the top. So I drove up to the top and I thought, okay, I'm just going to sit up here until I calm down. And uh, a big wind came up, blew leaves all over the place, blew my hair all over the place. And it was almost like somebody going, hey, you made it, kid, you know. <laughs> You're going to make it. Uh, I still don't know what happened. <clears throat> Because nothing like that had ever happened before, and it's never happened since. But when I saw this quote the other day, that there may be vestiges of other realities, that if you're open to those, you might actually get a chance to interact or, or experience them or something, uh, uh, which is what I, th I think must have happened. You know, I still can't explain it, but it was like really clear that something else was going on that saved me from basically a certain death. Which is the only reason I was here to tell you that story today. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> That's kind of it. <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Has anybody got any questions? Happy to take a question. The, the, the accident that you just described yeah. was uh, uh, obviously a big turning point. It was a shift in perception of what the world was about. Yes. So are you relating that to the shift you've made from, from illustrative art to another form of illustrative art using photography? Thank you for that question. Yes. <clears throat> I, I, I do think that what's going on for me now is less uh, what I, I believed in all my concepts of what should happen and more of, of, of me making myself accessible to what, what is and that I might not otherwise notice. I mean, I'm walking by this stuff every day, and like, there's a traffic circle that goes up to where I live. And there's a traffic circle with an outcrop right there. I've got like two or three images from that traffic circle. And hundreds of cars drive by that place every day, including myself. But every time I go by, I go, there's the lion face right there. And uh, it is, what I'm doing now is nothing like what I've ever done. And I, partly what I'm doing is accepting that uh, my path as an artist doesn't need to involve suffering and, 
and angst and, and travel to far distant places like, you know, I'd, I'd love to go to Nepal, but I don't need to go to Nepal to, to do what I do. I opened myself to the possibility that, that what was trying to get my attention, I was standing on it or that I could reach out and touch it. It was that close if I would just be open and, and aware and pay attention to those things and not go, hey, that's nothing, you know, that's a... That's an oil stain, you don't know that there's nothing there for you. And I don't say that to myself anymore. I, I look at absolutely everything as potentially something trying to get my attention. And, and I feel like I'm just helping things tell their story. Like that piece of rock there, uh, I feel as though I've kind of uh, just enabled its story to, to come out into the world. And, and, and I'm kind of almost nothing to do with it. I mean, it, I, I touched it, but I didn't direct it. Where was that rock? That particular rock is, are you familiar with Mount Suhalem over in, uh, by Maple Bay in Duncan? No. Mount Suhalem is one of those places where the, the ancient seabed Earth's crust has been tilted up through tectonic action. So there's a whole bunch of different layers going on in it. And, uh, and maybe it was 20 years ago or so, a developer decided they were going to put a golf course on the top of the mountain. I don't know how you would even get the water for the grass up there. As a result, <coughs> they scraped off, if there was any topsoil, they scraped it off. Any trees, they took them all off. And what is left is largely uh, lava that was an undersea lava flow. And it, it, it's, it's almost black. And it, when it weathers, it turns into sharp little blades, little sharp little pieces. And this particular rock uh, is not like that. There's, uh, there's the odd rock up there. I don't know if a glacier delivered it or, or how it got there. This particular rock is a sedimentary stone with multiple layers that is breaking down uh, constantly through the weather. So it's just up there. You can walk right by it if you go for a walk for, on Mount Suhalem. That rock is just sitting there. And because it changes all the time, I can't wait to go back and take some more images. Like that particular piece is a piece of texture perhaps that big on one stone. And they're all over the place up there. In fact, I understand that the person who bought that piece uh, might be here today. I don't know but I'd happily take them to go see that stone because it's not going to look anything like that. I mean, I find this so fascinating that so much comes from something that, that looks like there's nothing. You know, what could be in there? There's a lot in there. Well, thanks for sharing your secrets. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Vancouver Island has, is constructed of such interesting pieces. And, and it's been described as like a, 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 a plate full of pancakes of all different types of flavors, all twisted and pushed and bent uh, because they were portions of ancient seafloor which is being pushed up against the North American plate. That's Vancouver, North Vancouver is the North American plate. And so many pieces arrived from so far away, and this is like 300, 200 million years ago, they arrived through tectonic action and they couldn't go any farther because of the plate. And the ones that are showing up behind them are pushing them up like that, which is why there's a lot of, a lot of slanted uh, layers in the, the it's rock here. Moving. It's, not it's, it's, it's constantly moving. Yeah. And then there's all, from Salt Spring all the way up to Hornby Island is all that sandstone. And I remember going on the other side of Estevan Point and walking up the coast. There was sandstone there too. I was like, wow. Yeah. That must be connected somehow in this pattern. I, yeah. I so much to find out. That reminds me, um, a, a little short while ago, I was up Mount Maxwell at the top, and right at the top at the lookout. So I was there for the lookout. And when I turned around, I was looking at uh, some particularly interesting layers of rock. The sandstone you talked about that everybody sees, it's that beautiful kind of a uh, creamy, cr 
creamy warm color. And it's very consistent and it, you know, when the wave action gets to it, it, it carves it out in those little holes. Right on top of it is a completely different kind of rock, which is a whole bunch of different kinds of rocks all smushed together. And the, yeah, the aggregate rock. Yeah. So the layers are really obvious up there, which is, you know, is hilarious. And that's about 25 million years older, even though, it, even though it's on top. But that, that's what Everything has got old. jumbled here. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the tectonic action jumbling things, uh, the, apparently this area has been under glaciation three entire times. So everything has been moving around. So anything you see, it wasn't originally there necessarily. I mean, except for the base layers. But uh, I, I find that just so interesting. There's so many different textures. There's fossils. Like just 100 yards from where I got this, there's fossils in the rock. And some of them are in really soft rock, so you can't take it home. You know, you try and get the fossil out, it, it disintegrates. And in others, it's actually really hard, and you can't get the fossil out because it's that hard. Uh, I just love that. I love that. Uh, being able to look into, it's like you're looking into a time machine. And the time span is just mind-boggling that we're standing on here. I mean, we're a blink. We're a blink in the history of this place. Uh, just a bit of an observation, Dorian. Mm. Um, the, uh, the theme of, of your talk today really is about transformation. Uh, the story you told uh, about uh, looking at the rock, deciding that uh, drawing boats wasn't where you wanted to be anymore, the story of stopping yeah. at the stoplight. And, and my observation is that in many ways that's almost a shamanic approach. And the shaman, of course, uh, are the mirror into other places of reality and yeah. being. Yeah. And I think certainly that's what you've done with these with these stones. And I'm so impressed by them. I really am. Amazing work. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shall we call it a day? Thank you. I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.